What is up, brothers and sisters? Welcome to the Mitch Gray Show. Thanks for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere you listen to podcasts. We have another uh, dear friend in life. She's been on the show before, and we've had some great laughs just in the last hour trying to make things happen in this crazy life. Eliza Van Court, welcome back to the Mitch Gray Show. Thank you so much. I, this is actually one of the few podcasts I'm coming back to twice because I had too much fun the last time. So thank you for having me. I love it. You and I, we could we could converse on this stuff for probably five days straight. Yes. And I'm not sure the people <laughs> totally. would enjoy that, but we would definitely enjoy it. <laughs> I don't so, think so either, but we have fun. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, before we get on to the to the to the conversation, it's amazing in the last year the people that I've met and have become really good friends with, but I've never really mm-hmm. met. And I'm like, yes. I've got this list of like 20 people that I'm gonna have to travel and just be like, hey, let's go have coffee, let's go have you know something to drink and eat. <laughs> and so totally, yeah. I feel the same way. I yeah, feel the same it's way. Amazing. Eliza, you've got a new book coming out, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space, Stand Tall, Raise Your Voice, and Be Heard. That releases May 11th, available for pre-order now on Amazon and I'm sure any other uh, major book dealer. So, friends, go pre-order Eliza's new book. I'm telling you, it's going to be great. The reviews are amazing. And, um, yeah, so let's start with a big question here. And I'm kind of... Uh, go back and listen to our episode that was released, I think, in November, because we're kind of going to continue the conversation, but we're also going to really dig deeper into your book, which we couldn't last time. We had to tease it a little bit. So <laughs> I want to start with a big question. Um, I saw a video on your YouTube channel that folks need mm-hmm. to go subscribe to, and I think it was something mm-hmm. you did maybe a year or two ago, pro- probably before mm-hmm. the pandemic. And you told a story in that video that really, uh, it, it really hit me pretty hard, and I'm sure it has other people that listen. You told a story about the idea of feeling small. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily have to revisit that story you told, but I do want to ask you the question, what, what does it mean to feel small, number one? And number two, you know, this pandemic Uh, suicide ideation is up, depression is up, people have been isolated, young uh, depression in teenagers is skyrocketing because they haven't been in school. And I'm watching social media and talking to young people and especially young, you know, females, girls that are dealing with, I have two girls of my own and it's like, what's happening in life? And that's kind of what hit me when you talked in that video about feeling small. I, I think that's happening to a lot of people through this last year. So what does that feel like? And number two, what can someone do in those moments that they do feel small, that that 15 year old girl or that college age girl that's dealing with that? What, how can you kind of prepare them for that moment to survive the moment, grow in the moment and find their space in that moment? Mm Well, oh boy, that's a lot of, there's so much I could dive into there. Uh, and I think I'll start with my own story. And then if you want to riff on that, we'll go that way. And if we want to talk about what people can do, we can go that way. Um, you know, when I give talks, people often see me. And I started to get feedback early in my speaking that people would say, well, you know, it's great that you can do all these things, but look at your personality. It's so obvious, this is so easy for you. Like, I couldn't do this. You're just this magical unicorn who can do this. And so I remember talking to my daughter about it and saying, I don't really know what to do because, you know, sometimes women are very hesitant to try these things. And Mm -hmm. she said, mom, because you're intimidating. (laughs) And and everybody and I said no I'm not and she said well first of all everybody who's not intimidating thinks that you know who right. is intimidating thinks they're not so that's the first thing and she said secondly part of the reason you're intimidating is like you haven't really been sharing your story mm-hmm. and so people just think you haven't had any struggles so of course if you haven't struggled then like why would they listen to you because we've all struggled so that's when I made a decision to share my story publicly in a very public way and that was actually my TED talk where I sort of outed my yes. story yes. Um, and w- when I was, so I had two parents who are absolutely wonderful. And if you get my book, you'll see a beautiful picture of my mother mm-hmm. in my dedication. Um, we can talk about that later, but we, you know, and she was a, by all accounts, an absolutely wonderful mother. And then at four and a half, uh, she became paranoid schizophrenic mm-hmm. and everything changed for me. My life was just turned upside down 
And she took me three times illegally. So one time from New York to Texas, and then twice from New York to California. And on one of the trips from New York to California, she actually, we hitchhiked across the country by truck. Wow. And so we'd go from truck stop to truck stop to truck stop. I still remember an incident where she was, yes, I still remember this. We were holding a sign at a truck stop and the, it started to rain. Mm. And my mother um, had to get us into a truck to keep us safe. And that is where the incident uh, that you hear about in the TED Talk happened. She was sort of sacrificing herself so I would be dry, mm -hmm. which is an incredible thing. So anyway, I mean, she was doing this horrible thing, but she was still trying to keep me right. safe. Right. So what happened in that, yeah, it's interesting. So I, what happened in that trip um, was so traumatic for me all, all three times. And you know, by the last time, my father, I would only meet her in the courthouse. There'd be a guard in front of the door, you know, and I just made this decision. I started conflating safety with invisibility mm -hmm. and being small. And I thought, if only I can be small enough, nothing bad will happen to me. Right. And eventually, I figured out that being small isn't safe. It's quite right. dangerous. Yes. But it took me a long time, and. I really didn't fully get it until I was in my 40s uh, and in mid 2000s, 2010s, 2014, I believe it was, when I was riding my bike and I was hit by a car. Mm. And I, even though I was wearing a helmet, I lost a lot of my ability to remember. I also lost my ability to communicate well mm. and I had to build my communication back. And that's when I really started watching women who are strong and in their power and thinking, okay, I'm going to break this down. I'm going to figure out what this is so right. I can get back out of this hole. And that's when I started breaking down the different ways to claim space. But I think right now during the pandemic, for any of us, and I am in that category, who've had any kind of trauma, it is a triggering experience because if you have any triggers, the pandemic will push those buttons yes. for you hard. Yes. Yes. And I know for me, my, I mean, the reason I was late today and we almost didn't do this is because I had a mentee who needed my help. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that this is a moment more than ever that we need to work to claim space mm -hmm. because we are losing ground and it is hurting us and all of us really, but women right. are losing ground at a more rapid rate than men statistically right, right now. So what does it mean to claim space for another you know there's those moments within humanity where i i grew up in the culture where it was pull yourself up by your bootstraps you know i have friends <laughs> that, i have friends that grew up in a culture that was kind of every man for himself kind of a deal which is really the same mm -hmm. ideology phrased differently mm -hmm. but there are those moments in life that we just don't have it within us Mm -hmm. to claim our own space. So you kind of alluded to that a little bit. What does that look like for someone to, to claim space for another person, you know, for a season of life? I think it's about meeting people where they're at mm. and helping them the way they need. And I don't think, I have seen a lot of webinars lately and speeches advertised and books that are like, I'm going to give you the secret to helping the people you love during the pandemic. And I'm just thinking, okay, that's the goal. <laughs> Like, give me a break because every person is different. And that's, you know, why I believe there have to be multiple strategies. You can't just give somebody one strategy. Mm -hmm. I, I will give the example for me that when after my third kidnapping, and there's a national APB out on me, I landed in foster care. There was all kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, when they found my mother finally. Um, and so it was really hard. And so my father, in order to help, got me a big sister from the Big Sister Big Brother program. Uh, and her name is Alice Green. I actually just did a podcast with her. And she is an angel pretending to be a human being. Christ. And she was a the head of the Big Brother Big Sister program. And her someone she was supervising was going on vacation and said, hey, can you watch my little sister while I'm gone? Can you do some stuff with her? And Alice and I fell in love and Janet actually had to pull back. So she became my big sister. And I saw her every every week for about three hours for seven years straight. Wow. And she still talks about how I would 
she first came to my house and I, she came in like all these things she wanted to do with me. But of course I'd just been on a road trip from hell. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't want to go anywhere. Are you kidding? Like adventure? Yeah. Like, please, no, thank you. Can we sit on and the couch for a little bit? <laughs> can, can we not? And so she, you know, she got down on the floor with me and she, and I, I apparently I just said, I just want to color. Mm. And she went, okay. And she sat on the ground with me and she colored with me. And that went on for weeks. Wow. And talk about meeting where someone where they're at. She literally got on the floor with me mm -hmm. and colored and listened. I'd never felt more listened to in my life. And she eventually got me out of the house. And she said I would hang on to her leg and hide behind mm -hmm. her leg. And she was okay with it. She didn't do that thing parents do that said, come on, get out there. Yeah. She just was like, Eliza's just gonna chill on my leg. <laughs> and so, um, and I, and to me, I think I a lot of that modeled kind of how, I, I didn't fully get it in certain ways, and particularly when it comes to race uh, until recently, I still don't believe you can fully get it when it comes to race, but mm -hmm. I got it a little more. Um, but I think in general, I didn't fully get, Alice really was the one who helped me understand, you know, meeting someone where they're at. Mm -hmm. And she changed my life. I was the flower girl in her wedding. When I got hit by a car, she was the first one there. And she crawled into bed with me. And we are into the hospital bed with me in the ED. And we're still friends. And I've had a blessing. I have had a, to have many women in my life who've done that for me. And I don't believe in bootstraps at all. I think it's a bunch yes. of crap. Yes. <laughs> I don't think anyone exists that way. Everyone who's doing okay had somebody along the way who, who yes. reached out their hand and said, let me help you. Yes. Yeah, there's a saying I love to encourage people with, and that is honor and celebrate the people that paved the way. Yes. Because you did not arrive where you are on your own. No one is no. self-made. It doesn't matter what people no. want to tell you. No one is no. self-made. It's impossible. No. It's impossible. It is not possible. It is not possible. And, uh, you know, with my story, a lot of people say, oh, my God, with all you've been through, because I, you know, I haven't even told half of it in this podcast. And I don't usually tell all of it because it's just pretty traumatizing. But people say, you know, oh, how could you do that? You're the strongest person. And my answer is, you know, I, I think I do have a little bit of my mom's oppositional nature. Um, but more importantly, I had a village. Yes. And that is what I, that's why I am who I am. It's, it's, it's the village. Yeah. That's wonderful. So we talked a little bit about helping others claim space. What what are some thoughts that you have on, you know, a lot of people find themselves in situations, if they're children, it's uncontrollable, where parents make them feel small. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's a partnership, you know, romantic relationship, marriage, et cetera, where mm -hmm. the, other, the other party makes you feel small. There are some really difficult things in life you have to navigate you know as, as a kid you grow up and you eventually go man that sucked i didn't realize it at the time but you sometimes find that out so how how do you if you're surrounded by these people that that make you feel that way how what are some mm -hmm. things you can do to disconnect from that even if it's a situation that you can't really totally disconnect mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so there are there are the situations that you can and then there mm -hmm. are the situations that you can't. I mean, it's just, right. you know, if you're a, if you're a 13 right. year old with parents, it's hard to disconnect from that. So what, right. does that, what does that look like? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think I'm actually looking for a section in my book so I can give you exactly what, because there's a great, <laughs> I really want to talk about this because I think it's so important. I think that when you're little, my friend Kim Munson Burke is, and shout out to Kim, who is a goddess in my Morpheus in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I love her with all my heart. And, you know, Kim talks a lot about your compass mm -hmm. and how we all have a compass. And then there's a part, there's a point at which somebody rips out that compass, or at least it goes sideways. And a lot of us are unlucky enough to have that in our life. And a lot of the quest in your life is to get that back. Yes. Um, yes. There's an amazing, uh, a friend of mine, uh, and she doesn't give me permission to tell the story, so I'm only, as I can tell it anonymously, so I'm not going to say the, her name, but she is in a, she's Native American, she's indigenous, and she talks about, um, and my friend Kim actually told me about this, and then I heard, met another woman who told me this story. Um, that there's something in uh, Native American tribes when someone has wronged you in this in her tribe, everybody stands in a circle mm -hmm. and 
the person who has been wronged walks up to the person who wronged them in front of everyone and says, give me back my soul. Mm. And the person says, I give you back your soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that every time someone kind of takes that bit of your compass, you lose a piece of yourself. Yes. They yes. almost like they feel like, and you feel like they took it, yes. right? So I think there are several things. First of all, really understand. I think the thing that happens when you feel small is you lose track of your compass. Something happens and you have a gut feeling and then you go, ah, oh, I'm not going to listen to that. Mm -hmm. I don't trust it. And fundamentally, the first thing to do is say, if this is, if I am feeling this, I need to listen to it one way or the other and figure out what's going on. Um, and I think that is the first step to figuring out who is making you small. Yes. Because often, particularly like if we're in love with someone, you know, if they're making us small, we get that ouch, and then we decide, we make up a story for them. So we that talk we ourselves out of it, right? Stay. Yeah, we talk, we talk ourselves, talk ourselves out, out of it. Of it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think that's huge. And then the other one is, is beware anti-mentors because those are the other people who can really rip that compass right out of you. Ooh, go deeper on that, anti-mentors. Anti-mentors. Anti-mentors, uh, for those who are a little older and who read the peanuts, <laughs> anti-mentors are Lucy holding the football. Yes. Um, and they are that person that you're like, this time you're going mm -hmm. you're gonna to keep letting me mm -hmm. kick it. And they're like, absolutely, Chuck. And then you're on your damn back. And it happens every time. And basically, they, right? They right. are your anti-mentor. And every time you're going, Charlie Brown, don't run, you know? And he always he runs every time he's on his back. We can see it with other people, yeah. but not with ourselves. So anti-mentors, it's so interesting. So we have our cheerleaders in our life, the mm. people who really see us for who we are yeah. at our best. And that's who we really are at our mm. core is our best selves. And, you know, when we are all this mishigosh, when we misbehave, that's kind of our yucky, you know, traumatized self coming out. But when you go to your actual core, most people are, are pretty awesome if they can just realize that part of themselves. Our cheerleaders see that. Yes. That's the part that they interact with. Yes. Our anti-mentors feel threatened by that. And they are the people, unfortunately, that many of us go to mm -hmm. over and over and over because mm -hmm. we feel like, well, if Bob says something nice about me, because he's always so critical, then I finally succeeded. Yeah. So instead of going to Tom or Jane, we go to Bob mm -hmm. and every, and we get hurt. Now what anti-mentors do, and this is a great way to spot them, is they do something called intermittent reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So they hurt you, they hurt you, they hurt you, they hurt you, they give a huge reward. They hurt you, they hurt you, they hurt you. And they've done studies on rats with intermittent reinforcement. Rats will sit there and pull that lever if they're gonna get like a huge reward right. every once in a while, right. and they will starve to death, even if there's a consistent lever next to them that gives them food that is healthy consistently, they will wait for that payday and they will die, which is why the house always wins in gambling, which right. is why you will never win with your anti-mentor ever. Yeah, it's almost like this side of us that, that when we're in a place of unhealthiness, there's this side of us that feeds off of that. It's almost like when you're unhealthy, you you use that negativity as your security blanket. Like like you alluded to earlier, you use mm -hmm. that feeling of being, you know, that feeling of small, of being invisible as your mm -hmm. security blanket until you come to this place of health and self-discovery where you're like, hold on a second. Your little your little criticisms wrapped in kindness. Mm -hmm. are not what's good for my soul. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. And, you know, I have a whole system of how to dismantle the anti-mentors. I call them also inner city, inner, inner emotional snipers. Mm -hmm. They are these yes. like, they're, you're, they're your inner circle emotional snipers. Yes. And they are, they're the people who should be the ones that are there for you over yes. and over and they hurt you again and again and again. And so that is a huge, you know, for me, that's huge. The other thing I think we can do, and this is something we can do as parents, which I think is really important, which is, <laughs> I, I call this, don't make your kid kiss Uncle Bob. <laughs> 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 Don't kiss Uncle Bob. That. And I think from the time we're little, our compass starts to be dismantled. So my example I give is, you know, we have our kids 
and we have Uncle Bob and we say, go kiss Uncle Bob. Our parents say this to us and we go, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And the parent says, kiss Uncle Bob. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, we are told to do something with our bodies, right. with our bodies right. that we do not want to do and that we are bad if we don't do it. Mm. And we suddenly start thinking, maybe what I think is right isn't because I wanted to not do this and I was said I was bad. And yes. so we yes. and we are told to do that in so many ways again and again. And you know what? Maybe Uncle Bob has a booger. Maybe Uncle Bob is a child molester and very, very dangerous. Maybe Uncle Bob is the nicest guy, but we just don't yeah. feel like it. But if you don't want to kiss Uncle Bob, you never should have to kiss Uncle right. Bob. Right. And right. from the time we're little, we start to dismantle our kid's compass. And one of the things I always tell young parents is if your kid says something very strongly, I don't want to do this, and it's not misbehaving, you say, you know what, you don't have to if you don't want to, that's fine. Yeah, validate that, right? Th th there's a reason. It's that idea of beginner's mind, that, that the child's mind is so curious and innocent and just, you know, really has no fear. So if a mm -hmm. kid all of the sudden says, I don't want to do that, and like you said, it's not in a state of disobedience, but simply saying, that doesn't feel right. And you can see that in a kid. A kid is mm -hmm. so innocent and curious that there, there's no filter there. And yeah, you're mm -hmm. right to talk them out of what they know is best for them is to totally right. go against that beginner's mind, that mind of innocence. And, and yeah, I, I love how you've painted that picture of it starts deconstructing that compass. And really what mm -hmm. it does is it starts affirming in a child the, the, the self-destruction of the compass. Yes. So then not only yeah. not only are their, their outer trusted sources deconstructing the compass, but they're being validated to start self deconstructing the compass. And that's right. Um, and we all go through it at some level, but that's tragedy waiting to happen. Our instinct, we, we get told that what our gut is telling us is wrong, is wrong and mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as soon as you start telling a child that particularly about something, I believe, that they are going to do with their bodies. Yes. You are setting a dangerous precedent. Yes. Yeah. That's that's wonderfully wonderfully told and painted. Um, we're chatting with Eliza Van Cord, a woman's guide to claiming space is her new book that releases on May eleventh. Um, I would it's it says a woman's guide because Eliza knows her niche audience, but I'm going to tell you this is a book about <laughs> humanity. And mm -hmm. I encourage anyone to, to read this book. Um, I kind of want to go away from all, you and I, we just go deep right away. We don't even care. I know, so we don't, we're we don't like, care. We're like we world care. changers, here we go. But I want to <laughs> change directions a little bit. Um, why did you become an author? What made you, what made you become, you know, because I hear that from people so often, I want to write a book. I've always dreamt of writing a book. And it's like, well, why don't you write a book? And the majority of people don't. Um, mm -hmm. you've taken it and told your story and you're changing the world one, one female and human at a time. What motivated that? Oh, that's a really tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my background is intersectional. Uh, it's cross-disciplinary. So I have a background in political science and the arts. And I've always, I have an acting school mm -hmm. that I've had for over 20 years. And I've written plays for my students and helped them develop plays with their own voices. So I've always been into writing. My mother was actually a writer uh, also and yeah. a poet. Um, but I never really thought of myself as an author at all. And when I had my head injury, I would go to bed at night remembering most of my day and wake up and half my day would be gone. Wow. And my friend Katie, I wrote a post for Facebook one day when I was awake and my friend Katie called me and said, you really need to write every day. That way you won't forget what happened. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's a really good <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I would write because I realized I was like a country going to war, mm. forgetting why somebody threw the first stone you cannot you know you know you can't learn if you don't remember your history right. if you don't right. remember who started it if you can't remember what happened you can't learn mm -hmm. and so i was sort of in this weird purgatory in my life where i couldn't learn because i couldn't remember mm -hmm. and um people often say you know live in the moment but i always say life is a collection of memories the moment's gone in a second yes and if you can't yes. remember those memories you you aren't you you are your memories right. and so you want to make good ones in the moment but you are your memories so I started writing 
I wasn't allowed to look at a screen. So I was typing with my eyes closed and every day <laughs> crazy. And so I would send these like typo laden <laughs> um, bits of text to Katie. I mean, every night I would touch type and she would, God bless her, she would edit them and send them back to me oh, every day. Wow. And every day she'd say, you gotta write. She'd call me, she'd stop by, you gotta keep writing, you gotta keep writing. And the amazing thing is I ended up writing a book mm -hmm. about my life story in about three weeks. Mm. Uh, some people think I had, I think it's called um, the hypomania or something. I don't know, graphomania, I don't know what it's called. Whatever it is that when you <laughs> have, you're compelled to write because of my head injury. Yeah. But what I found out later, which is really interesting, is at the time, they told me, you know, you have to rest your brain. And I couldn't do it. I mm -hmm. could not do it. Mm -hmm. Now they say, whatever you work on when you're recovering is what your brain will tell you is important. Really? That's and so you will, yeah, so you will oh. actually your brain will go, oh, I really need to work on, you know, I need to put a lot of effort into this because this is what this, this organism does. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing I was doing. And after that, I wouldn't say I became a better writer, but I will say it became a really critical part of my life and never went away. I guess that makes sense scientifically because we do know that the, the old saying that we used to teach elementary and middle school kids was, neurons that fire together wire mm -hmm. together so that does make sense mm -hmm. when you're in recovery and whatever you're doing to kind of spark you know your brain activity it does make mm -hmm. sense that after that it would kind of that would kind of be your go-to that's interesting i've never thought about it from that perspective though hmm. yeah katie changed that, my life in that way that's, and, that's and many other ways yeah <laughs> so so why the idea of teaching women to better claim space um, you you fell in love with writing it kind of was your healing place you mm -hmm. decided to write a book what made you go that specific direction well so <laughs> i would go after this i started my career giving my talks teaching mm -hmm. everybody what i learned and how i'd been able to recover and during that process i did notice you know these are the things that help women claim space i didn't have the word claim space but i right. knew this is what makes a badass you know these right. five things right. uh, make a badass woman and then that's book number I, um, two by the way we, we just yeah, came book up number with one, how to be a badass yeah exactly <laughs> so um so well actually i'll tell you i almost called the book conversations in the bathroom how to communicate like a damn superhero but then i realized it was more than communication but after my talks women would follow me to the bathroom and they would be washing their hands, they'd sidle up to me and they'd say, I gotta ask a question that wasn't asked in Q&A because I didn't wanna say it in front of the guys, but, and I started realizing that there were about 40 questions that were asked over and over and I would have these secondary workshops and talks in the damn bathroom. I was in there once for two hours, I almost missed my flight. And so I thought, you know, it really sucks. We have, these, have to have these conversations in the bathroom you know, we need to have them in the sunlight. What if I took these things that all these women wanted to talk about and I brought them into the sunlight? Mm -hmm. And that was really the beginning of the little amoebic stages of the yes. book. Yes, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, in the book, you have some really beautiful thank yous and dedications. And, mm -hmm. and I, lo I love how you tell the story of, you know, the, the small story of the people that really helped you arrive at where you are. Um, mm -hmm. There's a beautiful picture of your mom. She was a be beautiful lady. And there's something that you say in, in, in kind of that dedication to her. And that is, um, she told me I could do anything. So I claimed this space for her. We've alluded to that a little. But God, that makes me emotional just even reading I know. It. <laughs> I'm teared up literally every time uh, I yeah, hear that. I'm like, oh. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, the power of words, right? It's crazy. What does that look like? Um, you, you've told us the story both in the previous episode and today about that journey that, that your mom mm -hmm. went through and that she subsequently took you through as, what would you say, mm -hmm. you were four or five years old, I mean, really young. And, mm -hmm. and at mm -hmm. that age for something to happen and it's really stuck with you and kind of been a, you know, a, a guiding light per se and I'm sure of multiple facets. But mm -hmm. what does that mean for you to think you know, that, that was my mom and she was mm -hmm. the best version that she could be within mm -hmm. her scope of life. And now I'm claiming space for her. What, 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 is that, yeah. what does that mean? Well, you know, she was, 
She was an amazing woman before she got sick. And she was a writer. She was a poet. She was an English teacher. Mm -hmm. She went, taught in Harlem and brought her kids into the park and did Shakespeare before everybody was leaving desks, wow. you know, and wow. the, you know, the principal got mad at her. My aunt Nancy tells the story and she said, no, I'm bringing them to the park to do Shakespeare. Like, <laughs> sorry, you know? <laughs> so she was really a badass. Um, and my, dad said that you know he used to tell the story of she could just do anything she was so powerful mm -hmm. and he tells a story of being in the 60s and there was this big art exhibit going on with all the cool people in the 60s and they're in their bell bottoms and their jeans and their fringe you know off their leather mm -hmm. and my mom goes we're going in they're in they're in greenwich village and my dad goes we're going in there's a rope line are you insane mm -hmm. and my mom's like we're going in Wow. And my dad's like, in 10 minutes, we're in there talking to all these famous people. I can't figure out what the hell she did, but that's what she did. So that was my mom. And then the illness stole that from her. Yeah. It stole that from her. And she never got to do all the things that she could have done. Mm -hmm. And I know that she could have done amazing things if right. she hadn't had her life taken from her. And I wanted to honor her. Yeah. And that's what it is. I wanted to say, Mom, this is for you. I'm getting reclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that, we, that your listeners don't know, which makes it a little harder, is that my mom is a missing person. Right. So my mom has been missing since I was, since my, I was pregnant with my last child, who's now um, a teenager. And so for me, it's honoring someone who I don't know what happened to her. Right. And I want her to know wherever she is, I'm thinking of her. Yeah. I also do want to shout out, however, to the fact that I had a father who was a single dad for a while, who was amazing. And then I had a stepmother, Beth Prentice, who stepped in and I had a family. And um, and then I had all these other women like my, you know, who jumped in to help me. So it's not, you know, so I grew up with a mother figure and many aunt figures so i do claim it for her and she is you know i want her memory to not go away or fade away but i also want to say that um you know i wish i could have put every woman i love on on that page yes. because there yes. are a lot who deserve to be there yeah yeah that's beautiful beautiful um i i, I love the emotion the the tagline of our show is bringing the art of humanity back to leadership and Mm -hmm. I use the term leadership a little loosely because I believe everyone mm -hmm. is a leader in one form or mm -hmm. fashion. And, and I mm -hmm. love the emotion because it does, you know, we, we're, we're all humans and we all have this story and we're all navigating everything that happens to us or the choices we make. And I think too many times we live without emotion to our detriment. And so yes. I just, I, I, I love that. So there's five parts to the book. Um, I'm going to read them because I want to ask a question pertaining to one of them. It, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the title within the part really caught me, and I think it's apropos for, uh, for America, especially in the current state. Uh, part one is claim physical space. Part two, claim space collaboratively. Part three, never cede your space. Part four, claim safety in any space. And part five is Claim Space United. Now, there's some sections to part five that I find really, really intriguing. And the mm -hmm. first one is, there is a world white people can never fully see. Expound mm -hmm. on that a little bit. <laughs> well, um, this book was uh, a collaborative effort, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I happen to have a lot of mentors in my life. And one of my mentors is Dr. Nia Nunn who is a professor at Ithaca College, and she teaches about education, but also the intersection of education and race. And she talks about how when white people truly start to understand race, mm -hmm. it is very similar to a child discovering letters. So at first the child's in the car, if you've ever had a kid, and they're just driving along, nothing's there. They start to discover letters and they realize these squiggles they've been looking at have meaning. And they're like, S, 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 A, 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 P. And you're like, yes, yes, these are letters. And so when this happens, of course, white people can go up to their black friends and be like, do you know this racism? Right. It is everywhere. And they're like, yes, I've been reading for some time now. Thank you. Um, but it is that. It's kind of like this mind blow. And I think that often you need someone in your life or something that really compels you to 
see the world. And once you see it, I, I equate it to the matrix. You can't unsee it yeah. ever. Yes. Um, and I do, but there are limits to it. So I've kind of, that's why I don't believe in being woke. Um, I think you're woking as a white person right. all the time. Right. Even when you start to discover letters, you're never going to be as fluent because it's not your experience. Yes. Um, yes. But I do, for me, I have nieces who lived next door to me. I have one niece, and I am allowed to say their names because they're in the book. Marana lived on one side of my house. Prachi lives behind me. And so Saskia and Kim are their moms. Mm -hmm. Saskia has two kids, a white child and a brown child. Kim has two kids, a white child and a black child. And watching the difference mm -hmm. between how these kids were treated mm -hmm. compared to their behavior, which was impeccable all universally, yes was a daily heartbreak for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And it was the beginning of me understanding race after years of thinking I understood race. Right. And realizing I didn't understand a damn thing. Yeah. And the thing I understood more than anything else and what I have really come to believe about race is I don't know a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> and my only job is to believe people of color when they tell me, or you did a thing that wasn't cool, or this happened to me and it hurt. I don't need to experience it to believe it. And that's what I right. say. There's a world we can't see. I don't need to experience it to believe it. Yeah. I believe that world exists and I know it has because I hear the stories. Yeah. yeah, so how do you relate that to the idea of claiming space when you're talking about you know, certain um, racial groups that are really ignorant to the idea of race from Mm -hmm. we, we could dig into that for days, but, mm -hmm. and then you have racial groups that are literally a week ago experiencing the violence just because of their, their race. Mm -hmm. So, so how does that relate to claiming space? Where do you take that in the book? Why is that an important element of the book? This was really important to me. Um, white feminism historically has been racist. Mm -hmm. It really has been. It has perpetuated white power structures and it has been all about the white woman experience, which is why a lot of black women just don't even like the word feminism. They'll use yes. womanism or womanist or something else. Um, by, and the, it's by the way, really quickly, I want to throw this in because it's, it's sparking thought. I believe, yes, if please. I'm not mistaken, in our last episode, that people can go listen to. I think we riffed on that exact subject for about 15 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So, oh, okay. So I'll keep throw it that short in. this time. Yeah, but I yeah, just want to yeah. remind people that we did talk a lot about the white feminism and how, what that looks like. So thank you for yes. reminding me of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you reminded me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I, I got a lot of pushback when I first started thinking about how this book was going to be. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff I heard was like, why are you talking about race? I don't understand. This is a book about women. Right. And I'd be like, well, the thing is, not all women are white. It's amazing how that works. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, uh, so I really realized, you know, if you're not talking about violence, police violence, for example, mm -hmm. you're not talking about women. Mm -hmm. Because when recently I was actually talking to a friend of mine who's a black woman, and she said, how did you feel when you knew you, when you had your two sons? Because I, I, I have four kids, two a nephew, a, two biological sons, and a biological daughter. And I was thrilled. I was thrilled when I had my sons. I was thrilled when I had, you know, I love all my kids. And she said, as a black woman, when we find out that we're going to have a son, we start to fear for their safety before they're even born. Yes. That is a woman's experience, a mother's experience. And if we're not talking about things that impact all women. We're not talking about claiming space. And I don't believe that you can claim space with one demographic Yes. at all. Yes. It's just not possible. And if you think about it, I always say, look, we're all divided. Mm -hmm. What if women actually united across differences? We'd run everything because the men are divided and where are we right now? And we can get a shot. We haven't really had much of a shot yet. So, but the reality is the more you are united, the more powerful you are and but you can't do it for your own benefit you can't claim space selfishly right and that and that work of unification begins within internally before it can ever be manifested outside of ourselves 
as long as we're carrying this separation internally and, and mm -hmm. battling this war internally, um, then it's really difficult to build any fellowship and communion and unification with others, especially those who we categorize as different than we are. And, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, that internal warfare for, for white people blatantly looks like authoritarianism and it looks like battling against the power of women and it looks like not accepting other people. I mean, it's just, it's this, it's this mess of insecurity, really, when you boil it down to brass tacks, it's the insecurity of something that's different than I am. Mm-hmm. And, that's exactly right. And, and that's, um, that's internal work. It's internal work. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think a lot of people are just, I, I think a lot of people are just really um, not prepared or don't give themselves the permission to take part in that internal work. Yeah. I mean, I think you need to make the decision that working for all people and being inclusive i don't like that word because i feel like you're saying you know come into my space but you know trying to really unify all people is really really important but i, I will say the one one thing i would say that's a little different from your perspective is that i feel like you're never gonna get it what's i mean i don't know your experience and i never will and i'm not gonna really get anyone's experience and I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. So I might say to you, you know, Mish, like men, they do blah, blah. And you'll be like, no, actually not at all. Mm -hmm. And I have to be prepared to go, oh, yeah, right. okay, thanks. Right. Please tell me. And it's okay to mess up when you're learning about this. But I also think you don't have to worry so much about being pure on the inside because I don't believe personally anyone is. <laughs> yeah. I think you have yeah. to worry about impact. Mm -hmm. What is the mm -hmm. impact? And mm -hmm. if you focus on impact, then you won't feel you need to be an angel to do this work, <laughs> right. you know, because nobody is. Yeah. We just, no. you know, we're human. We're all human. We're all human. Yeah. Which is what makes the story so powerful, right? Is, is the greatest honor we have as humans is getting to decide how we're going to live this life. That at the end of the day, yes. that is the greatest honor we have. And which actually yes. is what creates the most impact. That decision on how we're going to live this life is what makes the greatest impact on, on ourselves mm -hmm. and on others. Yeah, it's... Agreed. And we can't, you know, I, 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 think, I think where we mess this up is we really, blanket statement across the board, we really do our due diligence in trying to control the way others live their lives. <laughs> Yes, for sure. <laughs> when it's, we can't, like you just said, you're you and I'm me, and that's what makes it beautiful. We, we can't yes. control one another. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, we have, to, we have to claim that space that sets the boundaries and says, but I'm also not going to allow you to treat me less than who I am. That's and, right. and, and that's, a, um, you know, again, we've seen it in America, especially over the last year with the things that have been taking place is, is again blanket statement one side of the of the audience is saying i'm going to control things and the other side of the audience is saying no you're not and mm -hmm. that's when life becomes really interesting <laughs> yeah <laughs> really interesting. absolutely absolutely yeah. and i think it becomes actually extra in, interesting in some ways for the people in power because totally. people like, totally you know what i mean because yes. you're doing a lot of disruptive work yes and I have found that when you do that, the work you, the group you are disrupting, if you are a part of it, can get very vicious. Mm -hmm. 100%. And, you know, and so you have to be prepared to say, I am going to stand mm -hmm. here and I'm going to plant my flag and I'm going to make sure that I am living my life and my truth the way yes. I want. And I'm not going to necessarily go along with the power structure, even though I very well easily could. Yes. And I think that's a really... Um, I have many male friends who are doing this work and I am so uh, honored to know them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Very true. What is your favorite book? You've written a book. <laughs> you've technically oh, written a that. few books. You've published one. What, what, what's your favorite book? Oh, I got it. Hands down. <laughs> a Wrinkle in Time. A Wrinkle in Time. Nice. Madeline Langle. Absolutely. Yeah. That is my favorite book. It's about the power of love. Yes. It's about the power of love. I love that book. It's it's one of my favorite books. I could probably recite it and 
I also love the fact that she tells Meg to be angry, stay angry, little Meg. Yeah. You know, you will need all your anger now. So it's it's about the power of love, but also allowing yourself to feel and to be powerful. It's it's such a beautiful book. Mm-hmm. If you haven't read it, do not watch the movie, guys. <laughs> do the not book. watch the movie. It's horrible. <laughs> I, I won't even watch the movie. I don't want to be traumatized. <laughs> Read the book. It's a children's book. It's like a teenager book, but it will change your life. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, so tell us what's next. The book releases on May 11th, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space. Stand tall, raise your voice, and be heard. Um, what's next for Eliza Van Court? Where, where is all this kind of headed in your, what I call, sacred work? Um, huh. I don't know. <laughs> That's a powerful answer. I don't know. I, lo- I love that response. I love it. I really don't know. I mean, because I don't know how well the book will do. Um, the women who have read the book and the men have, because I've given pre-copies to people, have said, have messaged me um, and even forwarded messages from their friends. Because some of my friends, I gave one copy to them right. to give to a friend that didn't know me just to see, you know, and I've gotten email after email saying, you know, this book changed my life. It was so amazing. If it gets, I know I'm not a celebrity and I'm not filthy rich at all. Um, and so, you know, so uh, thank you, pandemic. But um, so, <laughs> so, you know, those are the people who get a really easy time getting the book out there because they can just pay for the publicity. Yeah. Yeah. This is really going to be about whether there's people power behind it. If people say, I love this book, I bought a copy for my friend. If all of that happens, um, and if it is as well received as thus far it has been, um, then I may have the distinct pleasure of writing another book and of um, just writing and speaking and not really having to hustle for that. Right now I hustle a lot because of the pandemic. I'd like to get back to a place where I'm just able to talk to people. And my dream is to be able to be successful enough that I can just do you know a certain amount of speeches every year, write my book and then do pro bono work with wow. kids in college who are first gen. That's one of my real passions. And if I could do that, um, my life would be absolutely amazing. I mean, I no, and it's never perfect, but that would be amazing. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your dream with us. I, I, I love that. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And are you, um, obviously right now you're really digging deep into promoting the book and, and getting it out. Mm-hmm. But are, are you still open? I know you've done some consulting in the past with you know companies yes. and with things like that. Is, that. is that something you're still, you know, people could reach out to you? Um, to discuss absolutely as well. okay yeah i mean i actually just did a talk for microsoft um and so i've, I've definitely been doing that work um and i and i'm i actually it's it's kind of interesting it's very different because i do it here and then i in my studio and then i go upstairs and have a right. cup of tea <laughs> and i don't hop on an airplane <laughs> but it makes it in some yes. ways that i'm much more affordable yes than i used yes. to be um yeah. and if you go to my website if you go to my website uh, mm-hmm. You can get me through Big Speak, which is my speakers bureau. Okay. Um, Good. We're wonderful. Cool. Perfect. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll put your website and all of your social media links in the show notes so people can can find you there. Of course, you're you're yes. everywhere on social media as well. So make sure you find Eliza um, there also. Um, and please for, reach out to me on link. Oh, do you mind if I yeah, don't have go for a little? It. Please do. Please do. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna plug. I'm gonna claim please some do. space. Um, I love it when people have heard me on podcasts mm-hmm. or they've done a workshop with me or a talk and they reach out to me on LinkedIn and ask a question. Mm-hmm. I just love it. I don't always get back right away, but I will. Yeah. And it's been, I've heard some of the most beautiful stories. I've, it's made me think, it's made me feel like I've made connections <laughs> with people all over the world. Right. So, which is really cool. So, you know, I, I really love that stuff. Same with my personal Facebook page. I've developed friendships with people I've never met. Um, so I, I don't do a professional pace, Facebook page anymore, although I might open it up again because I'm terrible at it, but because I'm just me and I suck at doing the professional <laughs> Facebook page. But, you know, please reach out to me. I, I Don't be shy. I, I really do enjoy people. That's why I do this work. Awesome, awesome. I want to start wrapping up with a few um, a few quotes that people have given about your book because I, I think the and and I'm sure you're like me the the testimonies that people give are the lifeblood of any marketing effort and because people only believe us to a certain extent right it's our own product <laughs> and so um, I love this sentence uh, by Professor Dolly 
chug. Am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, if a book was a hug, a high five, and a help session all in one, it would be a Liza Van Kortz book. Aww. I love She's that. That's amazing. amazing. I'm so honored. She's incredible. Yeah. Here's another one by uh, Joe DeSena. As a father who values self-sufficiency, confidence, and strength, I'll be giving this book to my teenage daughters. It's an absolutely yeah. must read. Yeah. So those are a few, mm. few little reviews about, um, about your new book that's coming out May 11th. You can pre-order it now. Woman's Guide to Claiming Space. Stand tall. Raise your voice and be heard by Eliza Van Court. Make sure you check that out on Amazon.com or any, um, any traditional bookstore. I'm sure that would be available to pre-order as well. So Eliza, finish us off. Any last, any last uh, encouragement or tips you would like to give? <laughs> Um, what I always say, because people often say, so, you know, what's your advice to people? And, uh, you know, my advice is only as good as my experience and my research. So this is not the most groundbreaking advice ever. But I do think it's important, which is everyone, I believe, um, believe you have the right to claim space. Yes. Yes. That is the first step to claiming space. And if so much of the time we're told that we don't and mm-hmm. Until we believe that, all the tips in my book won't do anything. I mean, hopefully the book will help you believe that, but it is so important to believe you have the right to claim space. Every human being does. Beautifully spoken as normal, as normal, my dear friend. It's uh, it's, it's been a pleasure again. I've I've had very few guests on my show twice, and this is... uh, (laughs) It's because I'm always nervous that it's not going to turn out as good the first time, but this is better. So what can I say? We yeah. do it right. We always hit <laughs> we it off. Right. We, we, you, we're going to be on the, if we didn't have stuff after this, we'd be talking for two more hours exactly after right. it was over. We, we do it right. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, thank you for listening to The Mitch Grace Show. Please go pre-order Eliza's new book, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space. We'll put links in the show notes so that you can pre-order that. The release date set for May 11th. But go order your copy now. And uh, if, if you're not a writer or have never sold a book, believe me, as a fellow author, it's great to get those pre-sells and get that momentum. So go find that. We'll put some links in the show notes. Uh, please subscribe to The Mitch Gray Show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mitch Gray Media. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.